and then we will get started. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen. And welcome back. It feels like we haven't talked in a long time. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving break. I know that it was a much needed break for IWD staff who've been doing, remain doing constant overtime and, and everything. So it was a nice long break for everybody. So let is, let's get started with today's leadership office hours call. Um, I think you all have my contact information at this point. And just a quick reminder that we're here to provide an opportunity to provide ongoing technical assistance and have a discussion statewide about any concerns or issues anybody's having and just oh, um, a place for you all as local workforce development area leadership to connect with each other and share your thoughts and ideas. Um, today, I do have several topics that I wanna go over. First, I'm gonna start with just some Pretty quick updates, but I think that they're updates that will make you all happy um, in, in some delays and some tasks and things like that. So we'll go over those updates. I then wanna talk to you about communications with the local areas going forward, um, effective January 1st. And then I also have some updates about our next steps for onboarding any new CEOs that will be joining us um, come January. So as always, you can um, unmute yourself and ask any questions at any time or enter your questions into the chat box and hopefully I will see them as I work through the agenda. So let's get started. If you remember um, at the last, I think office hours, I updated the, ta the key tasks and deliverables um, chart to really show you what, what the next things are that we're gonna be working upon. <clears throat> and I also added the responsibility party column to really highlight that we are now at that shift in this process that we've been talking about since last fall, which is that the CEOs have really kind of done their duty and they've gotten us to the point where we have that WIOA governance um, structure compliantly in place in most local areas. And the, the vast majority of the work gets handed off to the local boards at this point. You'll notice that that asterisk um, identifies things that the local board will be doing in conjunction with the CEOs but the, the vast majority of the work falls to the local board from this point forward. So I do have a couple of red updated dates in there. You'll notice that the completion of local area performance negotiations, previously it had a, a February of 2021 due date and it's now a question mark. And then also the local plans has a date filled in. Um, and, and if you notice that's a year out. So when I get through my updates, we'll talk about those more specifically. So let's start with those updates. First and foremost, the local area performance negotiation. So at the last office hour call that we had in November prior to the Thanksgiving break, I went through the process for local area performance negotiations and laid out our expected timeline for those. And at the time, the US Department of Labor Region 5 office was requiring us to complete those uh, negotiations by February 28th of 2021. So I had gone through and tentatively scheduled um, training dates and meeting times for those performance negotiations. I am happy to report that I continue to work with our partners at Region 5 to really stress to them that performance negotiations this early in the, in the process of new boards being formed and becoming um, aware of their roles and responsibilities and understanding the data and all of the, the pieces that really go into successful local area performance negotiations just aren't in place yet and that there's really no way for us to successfully accomplish this. So I'm working with them um, who, and they are working with the national office to hopefully get us a reprieve on these negotiations and push this back, um, hopefully quite a way. So for now, I will tell you that local area performance negotiations are on hold and I'm hoping to hear back from our partners at DOL relatively soon on some more concrete dates into the future that we will be expected to complete those. So for the meantime, what that means is that the state rates, the state negotiated performance rates will just apply to all of the local areas, um, which, is, which is a good thing because this is not a process that should be taken lightly or, or, or rushed through. So um, the, the update for today is that this is on hold and not something that you need to be worrying about currently. And I will provide more information as it becomes available. So um, the next piece is some additional guidance that I've been receiving uh, recently from the Region 5 office with DOL, which is related to the one-stop operator procurement. So as you know, we had previously provided guidance to you all that this is not something that you needed to rush to complete by December 31st, which we had initially said was the deadline 
way back in the spring when we sort of set deadlines for all of the key tasks. So the, the USDOL office recently provided technical assistance to the region five states related to the one-stop operator procurement, which is gonna have a pretty big impact on the process that you all go through. So I just had the last of those technical assistance calls this week. So my team is working on guidance to be able to provide out to you all that will help you facilitate this process. So the big piece of guidance that, that region five has clarified is surrounding, surrounding the competitive procurement process. And um, you know, every time that we have talked about one-stop operator procurement to this point, we have talked about an RFP. You have to complete your RFP for one-stop operator procurement, your RFP, your RFP. Well, that's not true. Um, the, the competitive procurement process involves several levels of competitive procurement with an RFP being required if and only if the total cost of the contract that would be awarded um, is over a certain threshold. And in Iowa, that threshold is $150,000. I think most of you um, are, are getting ready to procure one-stop operators at a, a funding level that is much lower than that. So what that means is you don't necessarily have to do an RFP to competitively procure a one-stop operator. So again, that's, that's great news. That makes the process much easier for the local boards to complete. There are requirements still on how to competitively procure, and that's the guidance that we're gonna be working on. So I'm hopeful that um, after the first of the year, we'll be able to get that guidance out to you, and then we'll provide you some time to, to go through that competitive process to secure a one-stop operator in your local areas. So I know that um, I think East Central Iowa has already successfully done their procurement, which is great. You don't have to make any changes to that. But if you are currently trying to rush through figuring out that process, I would highly recommend you wait um, and wait till the new guidance is provided. Of course, you don't have to wait for our guidance. You may absolutely go through with any processes you have to complete an RFP. Um, you know, you just have to make sure that any procurement you don't you do follows the OMB circulars and the um, regulations at 2 CFR 200 um, it, when as it relates to procurement. So if that all sounded like Greek to you, then I would suggest you wait for guidance from us and um, we will get that out to you shortly. So no, no imminent need to do a one stop operator procurement. I will pause there after those two updates and just see if there are any questions quick. Okay, doesn't, oops, sorry, going the wrong way. Okay, the other two updates are surrounding local planning guidance and the PY20 monitoring. So um, we have been working with the core partner policy team at the state, which again, if you remember, is not just IWD, um, but also the Department for Education and the Department for the Blind and Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Those state agencies are the agencies that administer the core partner programs for WIOA. WIOA is titles one, two, three, and four. So there is a lot of policy that has to be issued jointly by those agencies, local planning guidance being one of them. So we've also been working with our federal partners to determine um, you know, realistic expectations for when local plans need to be in place. So I'm happy to report to you today that we will be finalizing our local planning guidance, which includes a template for a local plan and also training on several topics, including LMI, the labor market information that you'll need to use in your local plans, how to, how to access that information, how to interpret it, how to apply it to your local areas. All of that training will be provided. We're going to be um, getting that core partner, or I'm sorry, that guidance out in early January with... Um, trainings to follow in January, February, and March, typically early March. And then the due date for the local plans will be January 1st, 2022, which sounds like it's crazy far away, but realistically it is like, what, 55 weeks away from today. And so um, we, when we give the local planning guidance, we'll give some more concrete details, but essentially that will give you all as local areas about eight months or so to draft and, and um, finalize a draft for your local plan. There is a requirement for you to post those local plans publicly and allow for public comment. So um, it, it allows for the time for you to do that. And then it also allows for I, um, the Iowa core partner agencies to have a 90 day review period. So essentially 
for your plans to go into effect January 1 of 2022. They'll be due to the state by October 1st-ish of 2021. And um, we then have 90 days to review and, and, and approve those plans. And then they become effective January 1st, 2022. So while that sounds like it's really far away, this is, this is a big lift, right, for the local areas. So it is something that you'll all want to start working on pretty quickly after we can get the guidance out here in January. But again, just rest assured that we will continue to provide you the technical assistance and support that you need to make those effective, um, which, is, which is the conversation that we had with our federal partners to say this is not something that we want uh, local areas to rush through. We want them to really take their time and make these plans effective. Um, because the plan is what you will use to document and dictate the workforce um, development work in your local area. So it's an important a document that you'll have time to, to work on. So that's great news, I think. Hopefully you do too. Um, and then one final update on PY20 monitoring. I just want you to know that our first PY20 programmatic monitoring announcement letter was sent out today to Mississippi Valley. Miranda, I think you're on the phone because you were driving. And so surprise, that's in your inbox when you get back home. Um, but I think you were expecting that. So um, we've been sort of scrambling to try to make sure we can meet some of these deadlines to get the at first initial monitoring started right after the first of the year. We'll be doing uh, virtual in-person monitoring with Mississippi Valley starting January 5th. So our work really begins now in December where we do um, what we call a desk review or we review documents and case files ahead of that in-person piece. So we needed to get all that done, but in the, in the near future, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we will send out um, guidance to everybody that includes the, the tools and documents that we'll be using when we do the monitoring so that you all have that ahead of time and can use it to help shape the monitoring that you do of your, um, contractors, your, your fiscal agents, your Title I directors, all of those things. So, and that's continued guidance that will, will come out. So um, this is a big step for, for IWD to do comprehensive programmatic monitoring for the year. So we're excited to get this going. And I also just wanna remind everybody that monitoring word, it, it tend, tends to be scary and have a negative connotation. And that's really not what it is, especially this first time around. This is really gonna be a baseline um, year for establishing, you know, the next things that you all as local areas need to work on to continue to work towards full compliance. So again, I will pause here and see if there are any questions about any of those updates before I move on. Okay, well, let's keep going. Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to discuss with everybody is the flow of communication from state agencies down to the local areas sort of going forward. And before we get into what that really looks like, I just wanted to give you a reminder. This is a, a slide that you all have seen many times before throughout the trainings that we've provided, but it's just an overview of what that govern, governance structure looks like. And I wanted to, to include this as a reminder that you know, the flow of information from the federal level down through the state, down through the local areas um, is really established by that governance structure. And if we keep going at the local level, um, this, this is a little bit closer look. Again, a, do, uh, a slide that you've probably seen before, but you have your chief elected official and, and your CLIO representing them sort of at the, at the top part of that flow of information. Um, the, the CLIOs, they appoint the board. And once the board is there, the board really sort of, like we talked about, takes on the, the bulk of that work and does a lot of things in conjunction with the CEOs, but the board is really there to, to represent the CEOs and, and do the work of the local area. Um, the local board then contracts out their, their board staff, their service providers, they're um, jointly selecting a one-stop operator, they're doing joint oversight of the fiscal agent, um, in, in order to really establish that, that uh, governance structure in the local area. So what becomes important about this is how we move forward communicating information down to the local area. So I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but you know, for a long time in Iowa, the, the Title I directors, the, the Title I service providers have really fulfilled multiple roles 
in the governance structure in Iowa. And with this WIOA compliance, that really changes. And there are true separation of duties as, as the law really intends um, between the fiscal agent, the staff to the board, the one-stop operator and the service provider. And those are really four separate roles being filled by four separate entities. Um, and with that old way of sort of doing things, there was a communication strategy that was happening where state staff from across those core partner agencies were meeting with the Title I directors, um, so that's the Title I service providers, directly on a monthly basis. And what that did was sort of create the flow of information from the state directly to the service provider and then up to the board. And you know, when we go back, when we look at these charts, this communication protocol chart really follows the flow of those other slides that I just showed you, specifically this one, where you know the information flows from the federal government to the state partners, from the state partners to the local area. And so it becomes very important for us to move forward in that same manner. So that when, when the state is um, communicating out guidance, technical assistance and all that, that it flows through the board because the board will often have a role to play in taking the information from the state and deciding how they want that to be um, pu uh, pushed out in their local area and how they want that information to be applied in their local area, right? If the state sets a policy, very often there will be a requirement for the local board to set a policy within the restrictions of the state policy. So the information needs to flow in that manner as well. Um, one of the things that I've done is I reached out to Miranda very quickly and I've asked her, um, I was, I'm aware that the executive directors or the staff to the boards are meeting on a monthly basis, which I think is a, a great structure. And that is really the, the place where um, our communication from the state should be. So I've asked Miranda if it would be uh, acceptable for the state partners from IWD, Vocational Rehabilitation, uh, Department for the Blind, Department of Education to um, be on the agenda at those monthly meetings so that we can communicate any information that needs to be communicated from the state to the local areas directly to the board. And then the, the executive directors or staff to the board would then take that information to the board and the board would decide how to communicate that down to the service providers. The information will also flow up in the same manner, right? So if there are programmatic questions that the service provider has, um, the fiscal agent, the one-stop operator, all of those questions need to flow through the board because the board should be dictating the work um, and the vision of their contractors, their service provider, their one-stop operator, their fiscal agent. You will notice on this um, slide, there is a dashed line from IWD directly to the fiscal agent. And that's related to the direct contractual relationship that IWD has with the fiscal agents. If you remember, we are contracting the money to the local board um, via a fiscal agent, right? So there is a necessity for IWD to communicate directly to the fiscal agents as it relates to that contract. But I would highly recommend that any communication between the fiscal agent and IWD includes a CC to that local board director so that the local board is fully aware of, of all of the um, happenings and goings on regarding their funds. Um, I think I covered it all. Lori, am I missing anything? I don't I think don't so. Think so. Okay. Um, so I just wanna take a pause there and ask if there are any questions, thoughts, concerns about this um, information and, and this change. Michelle, this is Michelle Wilson in Southwest Iowa. Hi. Hi. Um, that totally makes sense to me. And I, I've seen that. I experienced that very similar structure when I worked in the workforce system in North Carolina quite a while ago. We had that system like I of communication. And it seemed to flow very, very well. Um, my, my only question is, and I'm sure we'll see it as we move forward, but that monthly um, staff to the board training, I was just a little unclear of... Um, the other parties that you were mentioning being involved with it. I don't know if you could clarify your vision for that meeting. Um, are you talking about the meetings that you all already have, Michelle? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, 
realistically, there are, remember, there are more than just IWD as a state entity or state agency that are involved in the workforce system. So there are, there's the Title I program, which is the funding that flows um, directly to you all that you select a service provider for. There's also Title III wagner Pizer, and that is funding that comes down from the federal government to the state via IWD. We have state staff that are paid out of those funds that are operating out of the um, one-stop centers across the state. And they're a partner that need to be at the table when, when we're talking about workforce, right? There's also the Title II program, which is the adult education and literacy program from a federal perspective. In Iowa, that, that program is administered by the Department of Education. So I have counterparts at the Department of Education that are doing the same things over Title II that I'm doing over Title I and Title III. Additionally, there's Title IV, which is the vocational rehabilitation um, programs that in Iowa are operated out of Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services and the Department for the Blind. So they also have um, uh, counterparts, I suppose, to me at the state agency that would possibly need to be communicating things down to the local workforce system from the state level. So um, I would envision that um, myself, you know, Mike Witt, who is my counterpart over the over the AJC offices at IWD or you know, with IWD, and then our counterparts at those other agencies would be hopefully invited to those executive director meetings to be able to pass down any um, information from the state level to the local level. Does that even answer your question? Yeah, it did. I wasn't sure. I, I understand the structure of the four titles and how uh -huh. we all need to definitely be on the same page with that information. I just wasn't sure. Um, yeah, no, that was that was super helpful. Okay, I'm sorry. The other thing that I will add is that this is not going to be an overnight transition that just happens because it has been being communicated, you know, the, frankly, incorrectly for a long, long time in Iowa, right? So there are going to be bumps that we're going to have to work out and that's okay. And we also understand that as these local boards are new and young in their understanding of all of this stuff and still learning, that there are gonna be a lot more questions that have to come up from the service provider to the board, to the state level and back down than you know, there, there will be ongoing, right? And, and so as we all continue to learn and, and get comfortable in this new process, you know, I think we'll get better at this communication strategy, but it's just very important for us that the board is very involved in all the information that we're passed down because it's the board's responsibility to you know, establish that vision and then make sure that their service providers and one-stop operators and other partners are carrying out that vision as they see fit in their local area. Michelle, it's Miranda. Can I add something to Michelle Wilson's, Wilson's question? Yeah. So Michelle, um, so, also, so what's typically happened is the state leadership has met on a Friday morning with the Title I directors and it's been an opportunity for those directors to ask questions as long as, I mean, as well as those titles providing, you know, updates to the Title I directors. And we're basically just going to shift that meeting to the Iowa board staff meeting. Um, we won't probably do that at the same time as we've been holding our monthly meetings. We'll probably just make that a separate meeting so we can discuss our local stuff and, you know, generate our questions that we have for the state leadership team on, on the following morning or the next week. Yeah, I think that sounds great. And I mean, the communication from the state to the local board is just so important for this to continue to be successful. I think we're doing a great job. You know, these calls alone are a good example of our communication to you all. And it's just another way for us to continue that and make sure that we are communicating effectively. Obviously, we're always available whenever questions pop up and, and things like that. So, and this does not mean that, you know, when there's training that needs to happen on, say, the data management system that we use. That's not training that we're going to give to the board that we then expect the board to turn around and give to the service provider. Those are trainings that we would directly provide to anybody who needs it, that anybody that's using the data management system or things like that. But there may be programmatic decisions that need to be made about that before systematic training on how to use it. And that's what we want to make sure to um, include the board in those decisions because we should not be dictating from the state level directly to your service providers how you want services provided. 
Michelle, can I add just a couple um, Absolutely. comments to this? If you go to any other state that has local workforce areas, and I say it that way because there are some states with smaller populations that, that don't have local workforce areas, but if you go to any one of them that does have local areas, and it's the vast majority, this is the exact structure that, that exists there. Um, and so this isn't, um, this isn't Iowa putting itself on an island. This is Iowa coming into um, a protocol, if you will, I think that's the best word for it, for how to ensure that there's that local control and local decision making. Um, you know, I know as we have done trainings over the past year, we've talked a lot about that and, and it probably hasn't really, um, felt at times that there was a lot of local decision making because, and that was due to just trying to get the governance structure in place and the, the foundation, if you will. I like to look at it as a foundation. And so now moving forward with the big picture visioning work that the local workforce boards are responsible to do, this approach um, really gives the opportunity for those local workforce boards and their staff to um, make those customized decisions and tailor things that, that make sense for Northwest Iowa or make sense for uh, Mississippi Valley. And so that, that's, I just, I hope that this is where we're gonna start seeing and, and um, experiencing, I guess, that local control. And then the last comment that I'll make, and it's sort of along those same lines, I think some of the feedback, um, not really feedback, but some of the questions that we got while we did the local workforce board trainings over the past few months was it seemed like folks were really um, trying to envision what it was that a local workforce board director would even do. Um, and I think even going back to the trainings that we did and the work we did with the elected officials last year, you know, part of this idea of a local director was sort of theoretical and we really couldn't put our arms around, well, what does that mean? How is there even enough work for a local director? Um, and I think as you begin to um, customize things and tailor things for a local area and set policy at a local area and run programs and monitor service providers, you'll begin to, it'll begin to come, become more clear the role that that executive director plays to that local board because then you're now getting into the operational operationalizing, is that a word, of the, the foundational work that the elected officials have done and then the, the, the foundational work then that the local boards are doing. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is moving into this structure is really teeing up the opportunity for things to happen locally and will also help frame um, the role of that local director and why we've talked about it um, over the past year and maybe it didn't make sense, but hopefully it will um, a little bit more or be a little more clear. I'll put it that way. That's all. Yeah, thanks Lori. And I think this also just further stresses how important that executive director role or staff to the board role, I think everybody calls it something a little bit different, will be in a local area. Because remember that, you know, per the regulations, if there is not staff to the board hired by the local board, then this work falls to the local board itself. That this work cannot be performed by the fiscal agent or the service provider or really even the CLEOs or the CEOs. It, it is the, the work of the board. So it just really highlights how important that role really is and um, that it is, it is gonna be a full-time job most likely and then some. So um, yeah, any other thoughts or comments or questions. Um, this really will take effect kind of January 1st going forward because that will be the day that IWD no longer has any direct contractual relationships with service providers. All of the funds will be finally 
correctly distributed to the local areas via the fiscal agents on behalf of the local board. So this is just, this is the time now to, to make this shift, so. Michelle, okay. it's Michelle again. I oh, yeah. have a couple follow-ups. I'm, sure. I'm the problem child today. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, it saves an email later. Let's look at it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, like, on two things. Like, number one is, um, has this, how will this information, has this been communicated to those service providers already? And then my second question is, um, you know, Lori just alluded to that with the, with the you know, the increased responsibility um, at the local area. And I know when a lot of us started, you know, we didn't, there was that idea of like, let's just, you know, we're working five to 10 hours a week to, um, especially in the smaller local areas that didn't merge. And then how, I mean, in my head, I, I foresee this expanding the role um, more fully of that executive director or board uh, staff to the board. But I'm curious if, if Lori or Michelle, either one of you could um, expand on how you see that. Because it's one thing for me to say, wow, I feel like this is really going to increase the time necessary to adequately fulfill that role for the board. Um, but it's another thing to hear, you know, you all who have a, a bigger picture perspective that's more um, um, independent, I would say. Yeah, I can answer the first question. And Lori absolutely has more direct knowledge and experience with this to maybe help me answer the second question. Yes, this information has been uh, communicated this morning actually was the monthly Title I directors meeting. And so I attended that meeting and um, did inform them of this change. And I will tell you that this is a big change for everybody involved. And so it was, it was a little bit like a bomb being dropped, but this, you know, the best time to be able to communicate with all of them together. So I'm sure that they're still processing and, and what this means and how this will make changes in their local area. And we can come back and continue to, you know, answer those questions and work with everybody to make sure that, that they're comfortable with this, with this change. But yes, it has been communicated. Um, I also have spoken with and have, you know, the support of, again, those core partner agencies where, you know, we're in this together. Michelle, did we lose you? And as far as your other comments, um, you know, I agree with you. I, I think that, you know me, I'm sometimes not super delicate. Um, this is something that we have been saying from the very beginning of training that, the, that this is a full-time position in every local area of every size. And oh, darn it, I'm getting my internet is unstable. Can you all still hear me? We can right now, but you did fade out just about a minute ago. I'm sorry. Um, go. Yep. Sorry. That was my daughter. Um, you know, yes, this, this is a full-time role and that is going to look different in every local area, obviously. Um, but it is something that the local boards have to figure out because again, there are policy requirements that the roles fulfilled by board staff are very separate from the roles fulfilled by the other uh, members of the, the, the structure, the one-stop operator, the service provider, the fiscal agent, and those roles need and duties need to stay separate. Um, so I don't know, Lori, do you wanna add your experiences or thoughts? Sure, um, and um, Michelle Wilson, I think that's a, a really good question. And I, I can almost, tell that you're, you know, you're connecting dots and, you know, trying to uh, take this and, and put it into really practical terms. And I can, I can appreciate that. Um, I can speak to it just from the perspective of having served as a local board director before. Um, I covered a 17 county area that was urban at its core and then extremely rural um, sort of all, all around, it was like a donut and all the way around it was, was a rural counties. And so I only share that part to say that there were um, service strategies that we were, that I had to oversee that the, that the local board had developed and I had to oversee that within those counties and with those providers that we were using. Um, if you just go back to the first thing, or one of the first things that Michelle talked about today was the local plan. 
the process, uh, just that task in and of itself, the process of developing that is something that um, the local board is uh, going to, their role in that would be to set some key um, guideposts, if you will, uh, key strategies, you know, really give their perspective on what they see as the things that the workforce system needs to be doing in a local area. Um, they're going to, you know, come at that from, from data. You know, we talked about that a lot in the local board training. And so they're going to arrive at their conclusions, however they arrive at them. And then uh, that task of just writing that plan will, will most likely come to the, the staff person of the board. And then that person is going to have to then spread out and collaborate with different, the different partners in the system to do some writing, because it's not just a writing for the sake of essay writing, so to speak, it's writing with the perspective of planning and about what you're going to be doing and, and how strategies are going to get carried out in the AJC and how strategies are going to get carried out with this service provider doing these things and with these, these groups of partners. So just looking at that task alone, um, of getting that plan um, written in a collaborative way, adhering to the guide rails, if you will, that the local board puts on it and their vision of what they want to see. Um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of work involved in that and a lot of like collaboration and, and convening, if you will, just to pull words from the local board training that we used. And so, just doing that. But then all that aside, let's say the plan is already written, the day-to-day -day work of the local director is really on the then the implementation of that and how is that going and how are providers that have been selected, how are they um, honoring their contracts and meeting up to their contracts and, and how is the, the, the budget going and then the staff to the board and the fiscal agent work on those budget issues um, you know, it's, it's just a lot of um, focus on a lot of different issues at the exact same time, to be totally honest, and uh, just, but ensuring that that local plan and that vision is being implemented in the day to day uh, with the partners and providers and, and all of that stuff that probably I probably clouded it way more for you than I helped but there you go. <laughs> Michelle, this is Doug Bailey. Hi, Doug. Hi. This all makes perfect sense to me. Um, it truly does. Great. My, my concern is having enough money, administrative funding, um, to pull this off. I mean, because there's no expectation of any more dollars coming right you are a hundred percent correct and <laughs> I don't know if you want me to say it Lori if you want to say it Lori and I I, I um, <laughs> this is your show you go right I in know it. and I hate to say this Doug but um you know this it goes back to the initial discussions about the realignment of local areas and and having concerns about local areas not having enough funding yeah. um and, and I, I hate to have to say that, it pains me because I know how much work you all have done and how great everyone is doing, but that is why the money is the root of all evil, right? And all of the problems is because that is, gonna, that is gonna be a concern in the local areas that don't have as much funding as some of the others. Um, and so again, that becomes how, how do you work that out? And I, I, that's why I continue to stress these, these um, like the firewalls issue of this is not a role that your service provider can fill. Um, it, it just can't happen. This is not a role that your fiscal agent can fill. It is a separate role. And, and again, and that's the hard part about the work falling back to the board itself, because we all know these, these board members, they're volunteer board members, first of all. And second of all, they're leaders of companies and businesses and 
they have full-time jobs, right? They don't, they don't have time to be writing a local plan, which again, just stresses the importance of that, that director or that board staff. And I think Kathy's on the phone as well. She was on the call this morning with the Title I directors. And, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Kathy, but I think you had that epiphany moment and said, oh Lord, what have I gotten myself into maybe? <laughs> but you're doing a great job, right? That's probably a, a good way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, I guess all I can say is that I, I, don't, I don't like to lie or sugarcoat things. This is gonna be a challenge in some of those smaller areas. And all we can do is continue to provide you the technical support and assistance that we can to help you be successful. And, and to work through these issues and, and get these things accomplished. But I think that starting this communication protocol correctly is a huge step because it puts the information directly to you all with the board to be able to make these decisions, to be able to execute on the things that you need to execute instead of it coming through the, the, the service provider back up to you, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, Michelle, no, Miranda, I agree. Could I I are you more happy that you're retiring, Doug, or? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Appreciate the honesty. Um, Michelle, could I add something? This is yes. Miranda. Go ahead. I just wanted to add to, you know, and you can also refer back to that fiscal agent training that we had. There are some specific roles that the board staff does that can come out of program funding if your admin dollars are really limited. That is absolutely true. Yep. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's going to happen even, um, even if you had an abundance of admin dollars, you know, there still would be some programmatic things, but, you know, as you know, and Miranda, I know you know this, but as you know, that comes with, you know, there are limitations on it. it it's not just a, oh, we can't pay for it out of admin, so we'll pay for it out of program, you know. And I know that that's not what you're saying. So yeah, I mean that that is there, and that is available, um, and that'll help um, some. And and the limited funding is another reason why a lot of the local areas tend to do things like incorporate their boards so that they can then or they will apply for funding directly that can help supplement. And and so there's other places to go out and look for funding, um, but you would do that locally, right? And and um, and then administer those funds directly locally to help supplement things like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, th this is Doug again, Michelle. The, mm -hmm. it, you know, even even if we would um, throw in the towel and try to uh, go with a, a larger area, it's just adding more work to that larger area, and they they're. they're yeah, they would get the funding that that came to us um, to join in there. But I still wonder if there is enough funding um, altogether. And, and so pursuing other dollars, I think, is that's just going to be a requirement, right? I mean, yeah. I don't see how it works. So this is Jim Irwin. This is Jim Irwin. I'm on the... Uh, Iowa workforce development out of Mississippi Valley. So basically we combine two regions. We combine Eastern Iowa workforce development and Southeast uh, workforce development. And um, yes, there is going to be- Iowa workforce uh, development. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, anyways, there is going to be more work, but it's, it's basically by combining, we were able to have the dollars available to hire a good staff. Miranda has been absolutely amazing on what she's she does. She did work basically. I'm not for sure Miranda can can correct me. She worked part time uh, for the board for southeast the southeast region or southeast uh, workforce development. So that's like the Burlington, Iowa area. Um, we I'm from Eastern Iowa, so I'm like. Scott community or Scott County, uh, Davenport area, Muscatine, Clinton, um, Jackson County. So we combine them, but because we combine them, that gave us the dollars to hire a good employee that does just an amazing, an amazing job for us. So that's, I guess, I guess that's what I took out of this whole thing at the beginning was 
we needed to combine because there's only many, there's only X amount of dollars coming to the state of Iowa. There's you know 10 to 12 million dollars yearly coming to the state of Iowa through through federal dollars. And then Iowa Workforce Development as a pass through, they take a little bit off the top and then it's distributed out based on need throughout the entire state. So yeah, if, if you're you know if, if if we were still Eastern Iowa. Um, the Eastern Iowa region, and we just had, you know, our five counties, we could not afford to do, we would not have the staff in place to do what we're doing today, because we could not have afforded to hire a quality person. So it's very important that you look to your neighboring regions and have good conversations. And if you decide that you don't want to um, combine, then you're gonna have to try to utilize each other to help pay for and fund fund somebody together to get, you You want to have good quality. And, and is she making a good wage or a salary? Yes, but again, it, it's, it's like anything, you get what you pay for. So I, I guess I'll quit my rant and if you have any questions, I'm available, reach out to me. And I think Jim, thank you for your comments and you've always been very involved in understanding this from the get go. I do wanna just say that I think that the staff that you all have managed to find and hire have been great and, and they have done such a phenomenal job of helping you to get to the point that we're at. And, and now it becomes about like, for example, Doug or Kathy, I would take, uh, North Central Iowa for, for an example, I suppose, is that going up to that next level of not just administrative support, but actual sort of um, facilitation of the workforce system in the local area on behalf of the board, right? Um, and because again, even, even Miranda, who's doing a fantastic job, just like everybody else, or Michelle Wilson, or Krista, or Heather, any, all of them, Kathy, Jean, uh, who am I forgetting? I'm forgetting somebody in Western, gosh, Tammy, um, you know, they're, they're all doing a phenomenal job, but they all still should be getting their direction from the board, right? The board should be telling them what they want to see, how they want it to be done, you know, how they want those funds to be utilized. And where does the board get it from? From the CEOs, right? You guys set a very high level vision of that local workforce development area, and then you should expect your board to take that vision and run with it for you, right? And this is that point we talked about too in the very get-go when you guys all said, crap, I'm on 12 boards and I don't have time for this and what is this gonna take? And we said, trust us, when we get there, you can step back and you can let this board do what they're supposed to do, right? And, um, and so it's just that whole, that whole notion of that system kind of working together and everybody doing their piece to facilitate the system in your local area. Um, yeah, I think this is a great conversation. I thank you for participating, everyone. Can I make one more comment? Yes. Um, so Doug, um, to something that you said, um, some time ago and time has become irrelevant in 2020. So it was, I guess at the end of 2019 or maybe in January of this year, I don't know, but I know Jim was at this meeting and Kyle was at this meeting and Doug, I, you were probably at this meeting too. There was a meeting held um, in, um, at, at the Goodwill in, I'm going to say Des Moines, but I know it's not, Johnston, Iowa. Yeah, Johnston. Uh, with, Look at you. With the, I know, I'm rolling out my Iowa geography knowledge here. With the elected officials, with the express purpose of sharing information so that um, the elected officials could come to um, some agreement or begin the process of coming to some agreement on what the um, structure of local workforce areas should be in Iowa because it, it couldn't be 15 and because uh, there just wasn't the money. And so all of that for context, one of the things that we did in preparation of that meeting and um, and we shared in that meeting was you know some different configurations of groups of counties and what it would mean financially and um, IWD was there with financial staff and they were 
uh, pumping out dollar amounts at the time based on different configurations that the um, elected officials were looking at. And so it was clear during the prep for that meeting and during that meeting and those discussions that with the amount of money that comes into Iowa, nine is too many local areas. Six is too many local areas. If you really want funding to be impactful and be able to support all of the things that need to happen, you were looking at a configuration of maybe three local workforce areas in all of Iowa. Four might could have worked, but three would really put the finances of each of them in a better position because then you have one fiscal agent, one executive director, and then you would have more money to have a, a bigger staff for the board. And then you have more money for service providers. Yes, it's a bigger territory, but really it's a balance, but the balance is in the favor of broader areas. Um, so you're on, you're on the right track. And um, this is probably going to be an issue that Iowa has to wrestle with, um, you know, in the next year or so, if I had to guess. So just my two cents. No, thank, thank you. And thanks to Jim too. Uh, um, yeah, it's going to take some studying. Yep. And, and Kathy I think, and I will be talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, going, going from 15 to nine was a great first step. And, you know, like I said before, and I will say it again, and I will continue to say it, we are here to support any amount of local areas that Iowa has. Obviously, the money dictates what we can do. And so we want to try to, to use the funds as effectively as possible. And I mean, this is the, the result of, of living in a state where unemployment has just been historically low and much lower than other states, and which is a great issue, right? Then what happens is the people that we're serving through our workforce development system are truly the hardest to serve, right? Um, they truly have the most barriers and the most, um, they, they need the most assistance, which is unfortunately probably the most expensive. So it's kind of a vicious cycle, but I really think that you're all on the right track and we will continue to support you in any way possible. And you know, you, you all have my phone number. Um, I'm pretty much available all the time, unless the Hawkeyes are playing, then don't bother me, please. Um, but you know, if the Cyclones are playing, you can call me all you want. <laughs> okay. Hey, Doug, Doug and Kathy, I put my cell phone number in the chat, the group chat, so you can grab that if you have any questions or want some feedback. Um, another resource, Kyle has been very active in this. Kyle's probably had more controversy up in his area than I have. We've, our, our board has been on board with this almost from the get-go. I've been, you know, very fortunate in Eastern Iowa, well, the Mississippi Valley region, very fortunate that we've got a lot of, a lot of very active board of supervisors that are, that have been involved and even dumbfounded. We've had some that were just dumbfounded that the dollars that we had no idea where those dollars were going or being used for, that's probably been our most, uh, um, probably the biggest reason as why we jumped on board so eagerly, just trying to get a control and get a handle on, on what is actually happening in our backyard, happening for our businesses and for our constituents. So again, that's my, my cell number's there, write it down. If you need it, great. If you don't, you know, it's not a problem. Just, it's there. Thanks. You guys have a great day. Thanks, Jim. Okay, let's move on to our, what time? I don't even know what time it is. Oh, we got a couple minutes. Okay, um, onboarding for new CEO. So I know that this is one of the concerns that we all had from the very beginning, which is, okay, we came out in the fall of 2019, we did this massive comprehensive training for all 99 CEOs and what happens when they change or what happens when, you know, somebody gets assigned to a different 
um, area of, of expertise for their board of supervisors and things like that. And we, we made a commitment then, and we're going to continue to make that commitment that we will make sure that this is ongoing training so that this knowledge doesn't get lost again and, and it stays in the forefront of those people who need it. So we are working very diligently on plans to make sure that that happens. So I just wanna share with you briefly what that looks like. There really will be kind of a two-pronged approach um, for, for this. There's gonna be information that will be provided by IWD. If you guys remember back into the fall of 2019, we gave you like a hundred page CEO roles and responsibilities guide. We've also done recordings of the information that was presented in all of those trainings. So all of that's gonna be made available again by IWD to any new CEOs or CEOs that are new to workforce development, or quite frankly, any CEO that wants to hear it again. I mean, I'm open to any CEO attending to the training. Um, so um, our plan will be to do that around February of this coming year. I actually coincidentally have reached out to Doug and Jim and gotten some kind of information from them, pick their brains a little bit about how the process works for newly elected uh, board of supervisors or you know people who get a new position on their board of supervisors to, to be over workforce development. So it sounds to me like what will happen is within that first week of January, the, the chair of the county board of supervisors will assign um, you all or any new CEOs, um, their, their committees or, or their areas of expertise, I'm not sure what you all call it, um, and that you'll know that. So what I will plan to do is reach out to the board staff, executive directors in early January and ask them to provide me um, a list. They'll probably need to reach out to all of the County Board of Supervisors to, to make sure they know who their CEOs are um, and then, then pass that information to me. We'll identify any new CEOs and, and get training set up for them in February. Um, I did just wanna reach out to you all having been through this experience to say, what's important? What do we need to not forget? Or what um, do you think we could do to make sure that that training is effective? So if anybody has any thoughts on that, I'd really appreciate it. And you can always think about it later and shoot me an email too. Hi, Michelle. It's Miranda. Hi. Hi. I don't have a specific question around that, but and I'm sure it says it in the CEO agreement, and I just don't remember. But when there's a new CEO, does the agreement have to be re-signed by everyone? It, it does, correct, Lori? Okay. Not everyone, just the new CEO. Just the I new know. CEO, okay. Well, Maybe, but Lori, there's, there's, not, there's, not a, um, there's not a straight answer to that. Uh. Each, of the, each of the groups of C, that's a local decision. That's why. The, Thank you. So, gotcha. Um, the CEOs had to put in their agreement what they were going to do when there was a CEO change. Um, so okay. whatever is spelled out in Mississippi Valley is what is, is, is what it is. And, and, you know, that can look different than in another area. Thank you for reminding me of that, Lori. Okay. Yep. No um, this, the second sort of prong of approach to that is information that will need to be provided by the local board to the CEOs, right? So I'm working on uh, training documents and things like that with Lori, with Mayor, and we'll get that out so that everybody knows exactly what they would be responsible to share with new CEOs. And really that's just sort of like rosters of who everybody else is. So they have contact information, who are the board members, all that information would come locally from the local board to any new CEO. So um, again, if you think about it and you have any ideas for things you think that would be really important to include, please let me know and we will make sure that that happens and then we will make sure that that needs to continue to happen yearly or every two years, depending on, you know, election cycles, I suppose. I'll figure that part out later. Right now, I'm just worried about this one. Um, so we'll get through it and get everybody trained. Um, so that I, that's my last slide for the day. Does anybody have any questions for today. Um, I added this nice sparkly graphic. I can't believe it's 2021 already. Like Lori said, time has no meaning these days when I'm stuck in my house and never leave. Um, but it, our next meeting will be on Friday, January 8th, because our next meeting falls, I believe, on the holiday on Christmas. So um, any questions or final comments for the day? Michelle, it's Miranda again, sorry. Yeah. Um, a topic you might want to discuss at the next one is kind of those ticket to work funds and you know okay. where they actually go and you know, and the previous funding, just because I know there's a lot of 
talk going around about those right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so we, I think it was at the last CEO training for those of you that missed it. And the recording is not CEO training, sorry, office hours called on November 11th. That's not true. That was a holiday, whatever day that was. It was Friday the 13th. I should have remembered that. Uh, <laughs> it should be posted on the state board website where we talked about ticket to work funds. But honestly, that's, that's a funding issue right there. And Doug, I should have thought about this when you brought up looking for other sources of funding later. But ticket to work funding is funding for the local area. And it really should be driven. Um, the use of it should be driven by the local board. And um, so, you know, we, I had sent out communication and asked everyone to tell us who they want their fiscal agent to be for those ticket to work funds going forward. Um, and so that's a really important decision for everybody to make. And, and I think what you might be talking about, Miranda, is technically any ticket to work funds from last year that were given to fiscal agents last year is your money. And you, you would have every right to reach out to the, the fiscal agent previously and ask them to release those funds to you. Um, and for you to put those into a contract with whoever your new fiscal agent is that you want it to be for those ticket to work funds. So um, that's, a, that's a good reminder, Miranda. And if we need to talk about ticket to work funds again, we can absolutely do that. So I wrote it down. That's kind of what I was referring to, just so everybody's yeah. aware that those funds are the boards and not the service providers. Yep, they are absolutely the, the local areas funding. Um, the one last comment I will add, I know Doug's on the phone and I made mention of this earlier. I'm not sure if there are any other CEOs on the call today that are gonna be sort of changing over, but I would just really like to express my gratitude for your, your cooperation and your assistance and just you know all the work that you've done over the past year, year and a half. And it's really been a pleasure. And I wish you the best of luck in your retirement, Doug, and to anybody else, um, thank you so much. So. I hope you all have a great day, a great holiday season, and um, we'll see you on the flip side, I guess, huh? Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a Merry Christmas. Bye. 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 Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>